Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I hope you all had a wonderful Labor Day weekend and, um, and didn't eat anything I wouldn't eat. I always have to put that in there, right? Okay, so I've got a couple topics I want to talk about today and one of them is, does cholesterol matter? And I'll tell you why I'm talking about this, all right? And I took a lot of time to write this article and it has one, two, three, four, five references to it. And the reason is because I continue to hear this argument from folks who put forth the Eat Animals for Better Health um, campaign, it is that when we focus on lowering cholesterol, that's a misguided strategy because we need cholesterol, which is actually true. And they say that cholesterol doesn't have anything to do with being a marker for coronary artery disease. But um, yes, we need cholesterol, but the liver makes all that we need. You do not have to eat cholesterol in your diet. And absolutely, there is a connection between your cholesterol levels and your risk of coronary artery disease. So I'm going to talk about both, both of those things. First of all, let's talk about diet and its influence on cholesterol. And then let's talk about cholesterol and its influence as a marker for coronary artery disease. All right, so animal foods contain cholesterol, plant foods don't. Animal foods are also the primary the source of saturated fat in the diet, and saturated fat increases the production of cholesterol. Just one gram of saturated fat increases LDL cholesterol by 2%. Now, the average person in our country eats a diet high in saturated fat, and the folks who promote an animal foods-based diet eat even more, um, more uh, quantity of saturated fat every day. But it's not just the saturated fat, the cholesterol in animal foods increases serum cholesterol levels too. Now I'm not going to go through all these mathematical computations here because that doesn't translate well to this format. You can just read the article and all the references. But the bottom line is that if you eat 100 grams of cholesterol, you will increase serum cholesterol by 4 milligrams. Now to put this in perspective, one egg has 200 milligrams of cholesterol. And I'm sure you know, like I know people who are kind of carnivorous, they eat a whole lot more than just one egg a day. We're talking about eggs and bacon and cheeseburgers and, you know, steak and, you know, everything else, right? So, um, in any case, there is a, a very direct relationship between the diet you eat and your cholesterol levels. Just by way of example, in one study, 17 lacto-vegetarian students who habitually were consuming three eggs per week added one extra large egg to their diet every day for three weeks. And in just three weeks at the end of the study, the average increase in total cholesterol was 11.6 milligrams per deciliter. Average LDL increase was 6.8 milligrams and HDL went down by 2.5 milligrams on average. So yes, there's a connection. Now, um, and, and there are a, 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 um, an analysis of 244 published studies, including 8,143 subjects, showed that when you reduce dietary cholesterol, serum levels come down. So you eat more cholesterol, you get higher cholesterol. You eat lower cholesterol, you, your blood levels of cholesterol come down. Now, the second issue has to do with the connection between dietary cholesterol and, um, and blood serum cholesterol and your risk for heart attack. A study that looked at 356,222 men between the ages of 35 and 57 showed that cholesterol levels are directly related to the risk of coronary heart disease and coronary heart disease deaths. And the authors wrote, and I'm going to read this to you because it's very important, these data of high precision show that the relationship between serum cholesterol and coronary heart disease is not a threshold one with increased risk confined to the two highest quintiles, but rather is a continuously graded one that powerfully affects risk for the great majority of middle-aged American men. Now let me translate that for you. It isn't just people who eat a ton of this stuff that are at risk. In a very dose-dependent way, the risk of coronary artery disease and death from coronary artery disease goes up as your intake of dietary cholesterol goes up. And remember, this one included 356,222 men. The results of dietary intervention studies confirm this connection between dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol and the connection between serum cholesterol and the risk of coronary artery disease and events. Think about Dr. Esselstyn's study going on for 29 years now and he has shown clearly that cholesterol levels drop like a rock when people adopt his very low-fat plant-based diet by about 100 milligrams per deciliter per patient 
And also that those who maintain compliance on his diet and keep their blood cholesterol levels low have a very low risk of an event. In fact, in his most recent data that were published last summer, um, his compliant patients, uh, the incidence of events was 0.6%. It was 62% in non-compliant patients. It's a big difference, great big difference, all right? So the bottom line is cholesterol does matter. Your diet affects your cholesterol levels and your cholesterol levels affect your risk of coronary artery disease. Now there are lots of numbers in here and like I said, I didn't wanna just read them to you because that doesn't translate so well to this format, but I wanted to give you the idea that the medical literature is full of connections. And by the way, I'm waiting for one of these people who promotes an animal foods-based diet to produce a 29 year longitudinal study showing that people eating all this animal food and saturated fat and cholesterol are remaining heart attack proof and off meds and no events and that sort of thing. I haven't seen anything like that. So bring it on. You guys think that you know all about this. Match us study for study. Okay, I'm tired of looking at the short term stuff where you know, people always want to look at a 12 week study and compare it to what Esselstyn did for 29 years. Give me a break. All right, so on to the next thing. And, and this was really exciting to me. Um, Harvard Women's Health Watch, very traditional, grounded in traditional ideas about medicine, published an article that kind of blew my mind. And I'll just start with this. According to a lot of health experts and uh, government agencies, women who are 50 and younger need 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. Women 50 and older need 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day in order to maintain healthy bones. But according to Dr. Walter Willett, chair of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health, Women should be better, would be better off consuming much less. And he said, this quote was fabulous. He said, essentially, I think that adults do not need 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. The World Health Organization's recommendation of 500 milligrams is probably about right. The United Kingdom sets the goal at 700 milligrams, which is fine too. It allows for a little leeway. So his quote and the rationale for his statements were in this article uh, that was published in, uh, in the newsletter that was published in August of 2015. Now, in the article, um, the first thing is the 1,200 milligram per day recommendation for calcium had little evidence to support it at the time that it was established. And boy, this is a continuing theme in medicine with very little evidence. People jump off the cliff and make all kinds of rules and recommendations, etc. But how it started was scientists were hypothesizing that maintaining higher blood calcium levels might keep the body from drawing calcium from bones. And two very limited and brief studies in the 1970s showed that 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day preserved calcium balance in postmenopausal women. In response to these, um, the, the Institute of Medicine panel uh, raised the recommendation for calcium to 1,200 milligrams per day for women over 50. But Willett said it was a bad idea because the studies were short term and calcium balance is determined over the long term. And by the way, that's another thing that really plagues medicine is too much short term research from which long term conclusions are being drawn. Additionally, he says there was no evidence that consuming 1,200 milligrams a day um, reduce fractures. And, and this is another thing too, we have got to start linking behavior with long-term outcomes, not just better blood work, not hypothesizing about that. We do so many things in medicine and in health that have nothing to do, never been related to long-term outcomes. Good example. The article included the results from clinical trials that examined the effect of calcium intake on hip fractures. Two British studies and a 2006 report from the Women's Health Initiative showed that calcium and vitamin D do not prevent fractures. A 2007 study performed by Swiss and American scientists showed that high calcium intake from either food or supplements didn't reduce fracture rates either. Now studies haven't shown a positive relationship between all this increased calcium and reduced risk of fracture, but they have shown some risks associated with taking calcium and vitamin D. Uh, for example, a study of 1,471 postmenopausal women showed that those taking calcium supplements had a higher risk of heart attacks than those taking placebo. One of the reasons is that higher blood levels of calcium can cause stiffening of the arteries and increased blood pressure. Now, I was ec ecstatic to see some accurate information about calcium, and I'm sure this is a terrible blow to the dairy industry because the biggest thing they advertise is you need calcium for strong bones and we're the best source of it, right? Uh, but they couldn't help themselves on the vitamin D issue. They, for, to their credit, the author stated that vitamin D is produced in the skin um, in response to sunlight, and, and that in itself, you don't see that so much anymore. There are people anymore in, in the health field who treat vitamin D as if it's a nutrient. 
which, which shows their ridiculous ignorance as to functions of the body. Um, long before we ever took vitamin D in in pills, before there was ever that kind of thing going on, we all made vitamin D in response to the sun, and uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. But in any case, they, they talked about the supplements might be necessary because people wear sunscreen, so they can't produce vitamin D. I guess it's completely out of the question to suggest that people not wear sunscreen all the time. Instead, take vitamin D pills. And by the way, I am not talking about people laying in the sun until their skin burns. I'm talking about getting in the sun just until your skin turns color. Like here we are at the end of the summer. I'm kind of nice and brown from being out in the sun. Don't let myself burn. There's nothing the matter with that. That's how the body is designed to produce vitamin D. And a growing body of evidence is showing that this whole vitamin D thing is ill-advised. I'm not going to regurgitate it here. There are plenty of articles in the Health Brace Online Library about this vitamin D issue and how misguided it has been to start testing people and prescribing all these supplements. But the take-home point on the calcium issue is quite clear, and it is an alignment with the advice that we've been giving the members of Wellness Form Health for many, many years. Um, calcium requirements are very low. Uh, in fact, easy to get from a plant-based diet. And the, the uh, I was also pleased to see this. The article included lists of high calcium foods they couldn't resist. They had to put the dairy products in there. But they put a lot of things like collard greens and broccoli and kale and soybeans and showed how much calcium they had. So actually some forward thinking coming out of the Harvard School of Public Health. We don't see a lot of that from these people. So I'm encouraged. Maybe some of those folks will sit down and watch Forks Over Knives and really get on the bandwagon. We can only hope, right? Okay, that's all for today and for the week. I will be back to you next Tuesday with more news. And in the meantime, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it.